Please open your Bibles to the New Testament, to the First Corinthian Epistle. I want to read a little lengthy reading here to get into our lesson, First Corinthians chapter one, and beginning in <clears throat> verse eighteen. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world. <clears throat> For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews' stumbling block, and unto the Greeks' foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now I want you to focus in on verse 18 and verse 25. First of all, again, we'll note verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. Then verse 25 again. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. When you think about what we said this morning about people not believing, and that the believer of the Bible is one who not only accepts the facts that proves Christ to be the Son of God or that God is, but it's a disposition of mind that says my faith in Him has my, con my confidence then is in him, and I have such confidence in him that I will obey him. So we see he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. And that those who are believers, when it comes to their having repented and confessed their faith in Christ, according to Romans 6, 17, and 18, they have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered them, being then made free from sin, they became the servants of righteousness. Well, I remind you that being baptized, according to Romans 6, 3, and 4, is to be baptized as a form of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You're buried in water and you're raised to walk in the newness of life because at baptism sins are remitted. Well, to the people of that day, <clears throat> when we can say Christianity was brand new and very strange to the people that day, then this thing became foolish to say that a man who was condemned by the Roman procurator down there in Israel, which wasn't much to begin with anyway, and he was put to death in the most ignominious, shameful way. He was crucified. That's reserved for the worst people. And you're expecting me to believe that he's the only Savior of the world? And, of course, that's exactly what's being mentioned by Paul here because Corinth was one of the seats of great learning, as was Athens. And when you look at Corinth, you had a lot of folks there that pretty well were, their nose was in the air regarding their learning. They were a very rich congregation. That city was a rich place materially. But this is just ridiculous. So Paul talks about the gospel of Christ is foolishness to them. Foolishness to who? The unbelievers. People we talked about this morning. You can see it even in some today who believe that Christ is the only Savior. When you mention you must be baptized to be saved. They sort of smile at you and say, hmm, what's wrong with him? Doesn't he know you can't work your way? to obtain and earn and merit your salvation, which is not what the Bible teaches at all about why one should be baptized. But it's foolishness to people. Why would there be such a thing? 
So here it comes down to this. It's based on a man, as I said a moment ago, who was condemned to death, the most ignominious death the Romans had for anybody. You believe in him, you accept him, you obey him, you follow him, you lay your life down for him. He's the one that offers salvation. He's the one that can give life and give it everlasting. Now, how can a dead man do that? Especially one of that caliber. He couldn't even save himself. Remember the cry of the Jews? Save yourself if you be the Messiah. Come down from the cross. We'll believe. They couldn't, even the Jews who had all the Old Testament prophecies couldn't believe that their Messiah, because they had a false concept of him, would die on a cross, a Roman cross. So that's the kind of situation it was. But for those who believe, the word of the cross is God's power to save. But unbelievers call it foolishness. Somebody about, I don't know how long ago it was, probably back in the 60s, maybe earlier, wrote a book about Alexander Campbell, about his life, and they called it The Fool of God. And they did that because he stood up and cried out a return to the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice, and then to the New Testament as the last will and testament of Christ, and that Faith and obedience to the gospel made one a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And that unity among believers is going to be found only when people go to the Bible and follow only what it authorizes, what it teaches. A long time ago, God said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts, Isaiah 55, 8, 9. Man hasn't learned that yet. Man still wants to think of God as a human being and that he can be dealt with as another human being. People who talk so much about judging others when they don't even understand all the Bible teaches about that have judged God. And they've judged him to be somebody. They get pretty well, the old saying goes, pull the wool over his eyes and get up by about anything they want to. So by human standards and human wisdom, we dare not try to determine who God is and so forth and whatnot. But it's always been that the way God chose from the standpoint of a human being has been foolishness. How far back does it go? Well, let's just start with Noah. God told him there's a great flood coming, so build an ark. Now, I don't know what went on in Noah's mind when God said, I'm going to kill everybody, and here's why. They're doing evil, and they won't change. And then he sent Noah to preach to them, and, you know, what must they have thought of him? I can tell you what they thought of him. They thought he was a fool. That's exactly what they thought of him. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man until the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. When the flood came, it changed everything there is about this world geographically and topography and so forth. People don't realize that. But it did. And the way the whole thing worked is the atmosphere. It all changed. Now, that's as a result of sin in the world. It didn't just separate people from God. It corrupted this whole world. So God destroyed it. He even changed it from what it had been. You better remember, before the flood, no thunderstorms, no tornadoes, no earthquakes, nothing like that. But when God changed it in the flood, he caused all sorts of things to transpire. So it must have been a great surprise when Noah began to preach what he did to the people. Just go back and read Genesis 6, 14 through 17. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Behold, I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. Well, when you speak today and say there's the end of this world coming and we don't know when, as we studied about in class this morning, and everything material is going to be gone and there's only... One of two places left, and they're eternal. That's heaven or hell. And everybody living today and never has lived is accountable to God for their actions. I go and stand before God in judgment. 
and give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, and they're going to be consigned either to heaven or hell. Well, what, I, what, what comes after that? Nothing. It's heaven or hell. That's the end of it. It's the beginning of it. It never ends. It starts and never ends. All how we live here determines where we shall be there forever and ever. So the promise of God was that Noah and his house would be saved in the ark. And that all those out of the ark will be lost. Now that's an example of the foolishness of God in the patriarchal age. No man could see anything like that. No man could understand it. Because they depended upon themselves. They did not give the attention and the necessary intellect to thinking all of this. So we notice by faith Noah warned of God of things not seen as yet. Moved with godly fear. He feared God. And what did he do? His faith moved him. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. I've often wondered all the people around about while they were preparing that ark. What were they thinking? Noah's folly. Well, don't mess that old man. He's got his whole family hoodwinked. That's enough. Don't pay any attention to him. But the Bible in the New Testament inspired Peter, called him in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, a preacher of righteousness. They knew. Anybody else could have known that would have. And you know, when he built the ark, somebody said it wasn't big enough to hold all those people. Well, I don't know how many were there, but a lot of them before the flood. But God in his infinite wisdom knew it was big enough to house all those that would love and obey him. And the world would be punished then. Now that was the foolishness of God back there. Let's take up another. In the days of the wilderness wandering of the Jews. Now you remember the Jews over and over again complained against God for their lot. They weren't a thankful bunch. They were a spoiled bunch of people. Who appreciated nothing much that came their way. And they murmured or they complained against God. And he would chasten them. He would punish them for their sins. Trying to get them to repent. Say, you know what happened last time? You think you can get by with it this time? Well, evidently they did. Well, there's an occasion recorded in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 11. Where they had murmured, complained against God. And God, the scripture says, sent fiery serpents among them, and it bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Well, they had no cure for those snake bites. And I have yet to have anybody tell me why what Moses prescribed as a cure would work as far as medicinal properties that would cure that snake bite. But the cure was this. God told Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that's bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. Now think of those Israelites. And you've got to also realize there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people. They had to get to where they could see it, which would demonstrate their faith that it would heal them. They had to put themselves in a position to see that brazen serpent that Moses made and put on that pole for the reason God told him to put it there. So I've never seen any real municipal properties in a brazen serpent. Well then, how can looking upon a serpent of brass or made anything else cure a poisonous snake bite? That's foolishness. It's exactly what it is. Uh, we remember, remember we read a moment ago, Paul said, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. You see, what's happening is that their trust in God on the basis of his word is being put to the test. Because the only reason that a person who's dying of this snake, which he knows has been these fire serpents have been sent among them because they, were sent, they sinned, that's punishment for sin. Already people are dying. He knows why they came among them. You can think of what, oh, I, 
can't see how if I get to where I can see that serpent that that's going to make any difference to me whatsoever. Because, you know, there must have been all sorts of things among those people, regardless of how ridiculous they were, that they called something that would help a snake bite. Though it may not, that's what they would have thought. And a brazen serpent put up on a pole. But God knew how to do it because he's not a man. He's not limited by man. And all this was written. Now, what do I get out of it? I'm living under Christ in the New Testament. This was trying their trust in God. And if their faith in God was not enough to take him at his word so that they would just simply say, God will do this if I will do that, then they would die. It hasn't changed. God has one gospel. It's his power to save, Romans 1.16. It's to be preached to every creature because it is gospel, God's gospel to save. He wants everybody to have the opportunity to be saved. Christ died for everybody. But people look at the gospel and as they did then, as we read a moment ago from 1 Corinthians, they say, oh, it's, this is ridiculous. But then there's the foolishness of the cross. And you know who referred to this event to Describe himself. Jesus our Lord did. Jesus referred to this event in connection with the foolishness of the cross in John chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. And the scripture reads, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth may in him have eternal life. Don't forget everything we studied from the Bible this morning about belief and when belief saves. You will not be saved if you will not be brought to belief in Christ. But when you're brought to belief in Christ, you're just in a position then to take the next step. Repentance of sins, confession of faith in Christ. The final step to be forgiven of sins, baptism into Christ for the remission of sin. That's the beginning. And then to live righteous in the church. Then at the end of a faithful life, eternal life. So this was used by the Lord to talk about his own crucifixion. And yet Paul said to the Corinthians years later that the Greeks consider this foolishness. Well, let's go further into an example from Israel. 2 Kings chapter 4. 5 verses 1 through 15. You know about Naaman. He's a very important man in his native country of Syria. But he was a leper, an incurable, terrible disease. Now, if you read the passage, his wife had a, you'll see his wife had a captive girl from Israel. She was the maid for her. And she told uh, Naaman's wife, said, I. There's one back in my home country, a prophet that can cure leprosy. Well, Naaman did as Naaman thought as a human being and a pagan. He got ready to go down and see about this cure. He went to the king of Israel and he knew there was no cure and he thought they were trying to find a way to start a war with him by saying, you wouldn't heal me so we'll tackle you. But that was not the case. Found out there was Elisha. And Elisha didn't do what Naaman thought he would when he finally got there. He didn't even come out to look at the man. He sent his servant Gehazi out to talk to him. There was no hocus pocus flippity flam type activity of all these pagan people as the way they called on their gods. Just go dip seven times in the river Jordan. And when you come up the seventh time, you'll be clean. Now, what impact did that originally have upon Naaman? He went away angry. And he said, behold, I thought. He thought he would come out and act like all these other idolatrous people and put on some sort of big show and all that kind of stuff. So he turned away and left. Well, I tell you, he came there at that point with an incurable disease and I don't care what he thought, when he turned and went away, he still had his leprosy. Until he had some wise servants who said, now you came down here prepared to do whatever he asked. And 
he's asked you to do this. Now, you came all the way this distance. Why not just do what he said? And he settled down, and that's what he did. But at this point, go wash seven times. The River Jordan was foolishness to him. But those things of God that really try our faith in him and put our faith to the test always have us obeying God for one reason, one reason only, because God said so. You can go back to Abraham. Abraham is a different kind of person. Abraham is commanded to take thy son, thine only son, thy son Isaac, and offer him a burnt offering to me. Abraham didn't hesitate. Because he believed in God. He knew what God could do. He considered God as God and not as another human being. He immediately set about to do what God told him. Did not question. So Abraham's faith was tested and he came through with flying colors. But at this point with Naaman, and for those who did not receive the message that Noah preached before the flood, it's all foolishness to them and they're lost and Naaman remains sick. But finally he listened, and lo and behold, he dipped seven times in the Jordan, and the scripture says, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Because God chooses ways to do things that will put our trust in him. God wants us to trust him, to love him supremely with all that we are and have. I like the way that Brother Keeble, who's long been dead, he died in 1968, but he said, here's what faith is. If God told Keeble to jump through that wall, it's up to me to jump and God will make the hole. That's the trust you have in God. Instead, most people say, it doesn't look right to me. I just don't think that's the way it is. And that's what happened with them. And behold, I thought. So from the human point of view, those rivers where Naaman came from, far better than that old muddy Jordan River, and he asked, are not the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Because he had the wrong, he was wrong-headed, let's put it that way, about the whole thing. Now, sadly, there are so many like Naaman today. When they read, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16, they reacted the exact same way that Naaman did. When you read that we're to worship God in music by singing and singing only, and that's all he's ever authorized, that's all the scriptures you can find in the New Testament of the Christ, they just don't believe it. When they see they're taking the Lord's Supper and the assembly of the saints on the first day of the week, what the emblems are and what's, what it presents, it shows forth the Lord's death till he come again, they'd rather do it some other way. And you're allowed to see anything in the world going on in the name of Jesus Christ. And that means by his authority. But there is no authority for it. Well, let's go back a little ways to taking the city of Jericho. When Israel first passed over Jordan, they came upon the city of Jericho. And the scripture says in Joshua 6, 3 through 6, Ye shall compass the city... All ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. Then we go on down, and it says, In the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. All the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. Again, Joshua 6, 3 through 6. Now, if you from a, are using the, a human military viewpoint of the times, why would that happen? Why would that be enough to make it fall down? Well, of course, to think that way is to leave God out. Later, here's what we read in Hebrews chapter 11 as he lists great actions of faith by the Old Testament worthies. In 11 and verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Now watch it. By faith they fell down, but watch, after they had been compassed about for seven days. Faith and obedience. Now who tore those walls down? God did. On the basis of what? That which so many people would call foolish. I've, I've often wondered, what did those people in Jericho looking at all those walls think? What are these people doing? You know, one day they do this, the next day they do the same thing, the next day they do the same thing. You know, they must have got complacent because this is human nature. 
until that final day, and it all changed. We're to live by faith. We're to walk by faith. Romans 1, 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Since faith comes from hearing the word of God, then we're directed by the word of God. That's what it means to live by faith. Always has meant that. Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, 20. That's echoed also in the letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews 13 and verse 5. So I don't know how God is with me today since miracles have ended. But I know he can be because he's behind every law in this universe. He spoke those laws into existence and by his word they are still working. You do not have to worry about anything in the way of gravity ceasing before you get out that door. If it does, you'll be on the ceiling. No, really you won't. The whole building will be gone and everything else. You don't have to worry about that. You think for a moment. As I said this morning, they sent the astronauts off this past week. You know why they could get them into those orbits and just so-so and whenever to do this and when to fire those rockets and when not to and how much and so forth? It's all calculated out because of the laws of nature that God spoke into existence and upholds with the word of his power and they trust it so that they'll put people's lives into the hands of those physical laws and they're the same and they plan on them and they've been the same since we started all that stuff at least NASA did so Paul would say with the strength of God I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me Philippians 4 13 and we can I don't have to wonder. I just know God said, keep my commandments. God will take care of the rest. God's, and this will be the last point we make, because this is true of members of the church, some. God's strictness is foolish to some. It's not a problem they can't read the Bible and understand the words as to what God wants and doesn't want. But they take it like this. Do you mean God will actually punish people for their little mistakes? So you have white lies and black lies. You go to hell for a black lie, you won't for a white lie. There's no such thing. A lie is a telling of a falsehood. Everything about a person who becomes a Christian and remains a faithful child of God is truth. If you continue in my word, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. God says what he means. He means what he says. So who judges what is a little mistake and what is not? When you look at Cain back in the very beginning, you know that's Abel's brother. Both Cain and Abel brought a sacrifice to God to offer it on an altar. Cain's was not accepted. Genesis 4. He worshiped. He worshiped by offering a sacrifice. It was something that was sacrificed. Well, why didn't God accept it? Was God too strict? Hebrews 11 verse 4 says that by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Why? He simply offered it by faith, which means God had given instructions and he kept the instructions. Cain didn't. When you look at Israel again and you see the account of the two priests, sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, it says they offered strange fire which God had not commanded, Le Leviticus 10. That's the reason it was strange. It was strange to the law of Moses. They got fire from a place the law of Moses said, don't get it. How serious is God? What happened to Nadab and Abihu? It's just a little thing. What's the difference? Fire's fire. Well, God has specified where that fire was to come from. And when they didn't get it there, they died before the Lord. God killed them question was he too strict were you setting judgment on God he's not a man and you can't judge him as a man 
You remember, too, that Uzzah was, well, in fact, all of Israel was commanded not to touch the ark lest they die. And Uzzah, honest old Uzzah, but he was not paying attention to what he should have. They weren't transporting the ark like the law of Moses said. And when the oxen pulling the cart hit a hole, looked like the ark was going to fall off us, and he said, anybody would have done it. And anybody would have died because it was the priest that would do that and nobody else. Does God mean what he says and says what he means? Or are you going to say, well, that's just a bunch of goulash back there. It doesn't do any good for me. Well, that's not true. We're under grace, and, and, and that grace just wouldn't let God do that. We're under God's love, and He loves us too much to do that. Well, then come to the New Testament in the church in Jerusalem and see what you find there. Husband, wife, and nice Sapphira. If God hadn't stepped in, you'd never know they were dishonest. But God did step in because He knows the hearts of all men. And they died before the Lord. Why is that in your Bible? Well, I never, never killed anybody nowadays. Well, time's nothing to God, and we're all going to be brought into judgment. And because God doesn't strike down every sinner, and you better be thankful he doesn't. Right now, like he did in Adab and Abihu, or he did in Ananias Sapphira, doesn't mean he won't take care of it, because what's time to God? Nothing. Not at all. But all these things are foolishness to a lot of people. You go on down time after time. You could see it really in King Saul and the way he dealt in the matter of the Amalekites. Worked it out to where what God said, do is kill them all and everything they got. He worked it out in his mind where he kept God's commandments and he hadn't done that. And Samuel made it very clear. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 23. You mean he doesn't want the sacrifice? No, he wants you to do it like he commands you to do it. It's not a matter of sacrifice. He didn't say anything about sacrificing anybody. Well, we've kept all the best they had so we could sacrifice them. Well, old King Agag realized real quickly how Samuel viewed the thing because he took a sword and hewed Agag in pieces. I always get amazed these people talk about love, love, sweet love. I always say love just like Agag exercised or had exercised on him. You see, we have such a warped view of judging God the way we would do things. It wasn't just one little mistake that condemned King Saul. It was an attitude of the mind that led to that mistake. And it hasn't changed today. In Hebrews 2, 2 through 3, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now, why is that in the New Testament? And when I read it, do I read it as it's aimed at me? Or do I read it as aimed at John? John needs to pay attention to this. Truth of the matter is, every one of us, including me and certainly me, needs to pay attention to this. It's addressed to everybody that's a member of the church, saying, this is in the Bible to keep me on the straight and narrow way to heaven, regardless of how much knowledge I have of God's Word. God demands loyalty. That means obedience to all He obligates us to do. And he demands it today just like he did then, even more so because we have so much more and higher form of godliness. So, are you a fool of God? I hope we are. I hope that we understand the wisdom of God and why the world looks on the wisdom of God as foolishness. If God has commanded us to do it, then we need to do it. I see people all the time undressed all over the place. Women run around look like a, I don't know what. I see people do this and do that and not do this and do that. And every way they're acting is contrary to the way the Bible says a Christian should conduct himself or herself. 
and they give no thought about the day they must leave this world or this whole world's coming to an end and they must give an account of their lives before Jesus Christ. Now's the time of grace and mercy through a humble heart that obeys the gospel and seeks the forgiveness of the Lord on his own terms. But don't stand before him in judgment and say, Oh, but Lord, please, you've had all your life. You've got even now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. You don't even have an hour from now or a minute from now. A lot of folks alive right now that before we leave this building, if we're able to leave this building, that won't be alive. And it's going to be that way with some of us all the time, every day, till the world comes to an end. So if you need to obey the gospel, why not do that now? Believe and obey. As a child of God, are you a fool of God? Are you faithful to the foolishness of God? Or what the world calls the foolishness of God? That is really the wisdom of God and the salvation that's in Christ through faith in Him and obedience to His gospel. If you need to obey the truth, whatever your situation, we invite you to come over, stand and sing.